It's now a great pleasure that I hand you over to our chair this evening and our trustee, Ranjiva Bridgelau. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to our specially invited guests and colleagues from the Mona and Capel campuses. As mentioned, I am Ranjiva Bridgelau. I am the trustee of the Pathology Club of UWE and the chair for this evening's event. I would like to thank you for joining us for what is our eighth and second to last installment of the Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Students Initiative, also abbreviated CPAMC. Ladies and gentlemen, I am tasked yet privileged to be introducing the speaker for this evening's event, the University of the West Indies' very own Dr. Kenneth Charles, who will be sharing his wealth of experience and passion for pathology in a 45 minute overview of hematology and transfusion medicine. But before we begin, I will give a brief background about Dr. Charles and an insight into the noble contributions he has made to hematology research and developments here in the Caribbean. Dr. Kenneth S. Charles is a senior lecturer in hematology at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus and an honorary consultant hematologist at the North Central Regional Health Authority. He is a medical graduate of the University of the West Indies where he obtained his Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery and further obtained his postgraduate training in medicine and hematology in the United Kingdom, where he obtained a certificate of completion of specialist training in hematology, and where he was first exposed to the concept of voluntary non-renumerated blood donation. His research interest examines the disparity between blood transfusion services in developed and developing countries. He is convinced that replacement blood donation places a financial, social, and ethical burden on developing countries and is a keen advocate of exclusive, voluntary, non-renumerated blood donation. He's a fellow of both the Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Pathologists, and currently serves as a Deputy Dean at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus, with the responsibility of graduate studies and research, as well as the program coordinator for the newly established Doctor of Medicine program, DM Hematology and Blood Banking, in the Department of Paraclinical Sciences. Dr. Charles is also the founding chairman of the very successful University of the West Indies Blood Donor Foundation, which was established since 2011, October, and has executed blood drives annually, which in fact, this year's installment took place last weekend. Without a doubt, Dr. Charles is a motivating figure for us in the MBBS program, for those aspiring hematologists, and most certainly for those future pathologists. An inspiration to many, we are all honored, pleased, and privileged for him to be here with us this evening. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask where you are to welcome the very knowledgeable and most certainly the very passionate Dr. Kenneth Charles.
Thank you very much, Ranji. You were very kind. I don't know where you got that um, all that information from because I submitted three lines. I'm just trying to find my presentation. Is it visible to you? No. Okay. Um, are you seeing the present now button? Yes, I am. Right, click it and go to uh, your entire screen. Yes. And click your entire screen and it should come up. No, I'm sorry, it's not coming up. I'm on. Okay. You seeing it? Okay, so and I'm not seeing you at all. So okay, so feel free to um to interrupt or try to interrupt. You hearing me? All right. Uh. All right, yes. Okay, there we are. Yeah, so I, and you're seeing the presentation. Okay. Sorry, young ones, I'm not very tech savvy, but you need to be because it's a very uh, powerful tool, very powerful tool indeed, which I will show you. It's, it's, um, the effects could be uh, dramatic and global. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to see you young ones having assembled yourselves into this um, powerful organization because I am of the conviction that the pathologist is the most important and uh, influential person in, in our medical practice. And pathology forms the basis for all medicine and guides everything on a scientific and evidence-based basis. And it is to the pathologists that all come or should come for analysis and uh, robust decision-making. Having said that, I've been asked to address you and I'm told that it's, it's a body of young and highly enthusiastic uh, young students and some junior doctors who want to hear how I got into to hematology and uh, my career path and some things about hematology and the things that excite me. So I'm trying to com combine them all for you. So it's entitled Hematology and Transfusion. And on the slide there, you'll see on my left, 
It's a blood film of a 16-year-old boy who is uh, found by his health center doctor to have a left-sided abdominal mass and to have a, a very high white cell count and fever. And uh, he had several health center visits, I think totaling about uh, five or six over a six month period. Until finally he was referred into hospital by uh, his general practitioner. And we found that the young man had a, quite a high number of circulating blasts, as can be seen on the blood film. And his bone marrow aspirate showed blasts as well. And I was on my way to Sheffield that week for the British Society for Hematology Conference, which I try to attend annually. So I snuck his blood samples with me and took them to Sheffield where they were immunophenotyped. The blood was, and the blasts were found to be, there were two populations, CD10 and CD19 in one population, and CD13 and CD33 in the other. So the young man had biphenotypic acute leukemia. Some sets of acute lymphoblasts, some are acute myeloblasts. And molecular analysis of the specimen show the presence of the BCR able fusion gene confirming the diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia, which are transformed to a combination of acute myeloblastic and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Usually a terminal event with survival measurable in months. So sadly and predictably young man, he died uh, within six months at the age 16. It was, very, it was very sad, very traumatic. And that's the, the kind of thing we come across all the time. So you'll start speaking about hematology and blood transfusion as a career. I will speak predominantly about the British system in which I trained. I'll fill you in um, coming home, which I hope you all will do. And uh, who knows, uh, by four or five or six years, you may not need to leave home to specialize in the first place, but I think it is always good to do, to see the world and uh, implant your presence and make recognize the region from which you came. We'll share some research into the reality of a situation with which I was faced on coming home, describe how we built a solution, and conclude with uh, recommending the way forward. And then I'll share a few of my personal slides with you, my, uh, my bone marrow and uh, blood film slides. So these are the pathways to becoming a hematologist, which were available at the time when, when, uh, when I chose to do it. I chose to go to the United Kingdom because in those days I liked British music and I liked how they dressed. And I thought that they were less um, flashy and, and loud and boorish than, uh, are, are there any, uh, anyway, they were, they were not um, loud and, and did not overdo things, very subdued and I like that. I like the, the British type of music. I liked British comedy as well. And uh, so it was a natural selection. And apart from which our education system, uh, it was premised on the education in University School of London, of which University of the West Indies was an, an offshoot university in 1948. So initially, we were automatically uh, registered with the General Medical Council because you were a branch of the, of the University of London. 
But all that changed in about the 1990s. So now medical students graduating from the UWI need to do the PLAB exam, I believe, before being recognized in the United Kingdom. But in our days, we didn't have to do that. We could just have all the uh, MBBS from here and set sail to the United Kingdom. In those days, after doing MBBS, which I did, uh, just after then, the postgrad degree was a membership of the Royal College of Pathologists in Hematology. And there were no intermediary, intermediary required steps between MBBS and MRC Path Heme. One could very much go straight into it as a branch of pathology, as a branch of pathology. Later on, several people who did the membership of the Royal College of Physicians took to hematology. And eventually, membership of the Royal College of Pathologists became a prerequisite to doing the MRC PATH exam. So eventually, uh, hematologists started having membership of both colleges. And in the early days, this, this um, uh, caused some contention between the uh, pathology aficionados and the people who uh, were inclined towards medicine as well. But eventually it's all petered out now and it is accepted that the MRCP is an essential prerequisite to, if not getting into hematology, definitely into getting a training post in hematology. In 1996, the CCST was introduced, and the CCST is an exit certificate that says that one has completed a, a five years of specialist training and is suitable to be, to be a consultant. This did not happen before. So people just completed training and uh, completed uh, openly for consultant posts. But the CCST was intended to separate those who just passed the exam and those who had completed training as well. It was never really an issue in, in hematology because it, the MRC path required five years of training in itself. It was always a consultant exam. But when the CCST came on board, it was appended anyway. And after the MRC path, one could become a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists by being recommended by uh, two fellows of the college. So a fellow of both colleges on recommendation of existing fellows. Am I confusing you, Annalisa? No, I'm good so far. All right, I'm glad to hear that. Around 2010, and uh, Dr. Alfredo Walker could correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this. I may have been wrong when the MRC path was abolished and everyone became FRC path immediately upon uh, completing the, the exam and the training. Satisfied with the question. It was 2008, sir. Good evening. 2008, there we go. Thank you, Alfredo. Another meeting. Oh, all right. And, and, uh, so 2008, thank you, Alfredo. I won't tell you all how I met Alfredo because it would age me. And I'm already here at the end of it. Now, in the American system, again, this may need some correction, but uh, generally, it is possible to do hemopathology straight after completing one's uh, primary degree without an intermediary uh, step. And anybody who knows better could correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, this hemopathology, it's uh, confined mostly to laboratory analysis of uh, pathological hematology specimens, slides and bone marrows and, and stains and, and, and the works. And uh, on the other hand, 
one could do an internal medicine intermediary step and do a combination that's called hematology oncology, which also includes the therapeutics of uh, solid tumors, like uh, breast cancer, uh, uh, prostate cancer, and so on. Um, and when one considers that hematological cancers constitute about 2% of uh, all cancers, one can understand that uh, the theme oncology runs the risk and tendency of being overwhelmed by alternative uh, oncology. And uh, so those are the two general pathways. Uh, in the MRC path, I should add one receives extensive training in our blood transfusion and in benign or non-malignant hematology, which is not so benign at all. I don't think sickle cell disease is a, is a benign disorder, nor do I think thalassemia major is. And very importantly, it's, it lays a lot of weight on a blood transfusion. So one is trained in blood transfusion at the end of uh, the qualification, one is then eligible to be a, a director of a, a blood transfusion service in the UK. If one wishes, one could do additional training in blood banking. In addition, pediatric hematology is contained within the MRC path curriculum. It's a big block. So at the end of it, in, in my time, we all did the same MRC path and some chose to become pediatric hematologists. And uh, several of, of my colleagues did. And uh, even the people who did uh, pediatric internal meds, they had to do the adult or the common MRC path and became a pediatric hematologist. But there's no separation. It was just general hematology training and it took five years five years. There's a Jamaican system, which is a, a hybrid of both in that it contains a lot of the, uh, the non-malignant hematology training that the British system does, but it also includes the uh, aspects of the hematology and oncology approach from the United States. And this is a system that is a uh, still in existence. And uh, so these were generally the three options available at, at my time. Of course, there are others available now. Well, they are, they, I suppose they were available then, but we never considered them, like uh, Canada and Australia and South Africa and so on. These were the most um, psychologically and geographically proximal to us. So having done that, one returned home and one got the shock of one's life. Well, one got the shock in, uh, the, the, in the UK, and you must be aware of this, because during my training there, and I still tell this story to my students who would listen, I went to one of my earliest postings was in uh, Liverpool in the North, and I was doing a a uh, geriatrics job. And there was a 94 year old man who was wheeled in with a broken hip, having fallen at home. And he was being prepared for surgery. Two things I remember at that time, I considered one, is this man fit for surgery or eligible for surgery at age 94. Because uh, truthfully at that time, well, from my recall, it would not be considered in, a, in Trinidad and Tobago at age 94, probably not, at least in my experience. And the second, they wanted blood to, to uh, do this man's surgery. 
And my first impulse was to ask the man's granddaughter whether he had blood donors or not. And I will never forget that because that is the, uh, the episode that, trans that jolted me to reality and transformed me because I recall the Lilliputian nurse looking at me aghast and asked him, what do you ask her? Is that where they do where you come from? And then it occurred to me that it was something that did not happen in, uh, in England. And as things went along, I came to realize that it was because the citizens had what is called this culture. And I think a culture is just a pattern of behavior of a um, regular blood donation. It's nothing to them. And they do it routinely. So therefore, there's no need for anybody to be, uh, there's always a blood supply because it doesn't require many Centers why to have an adequate blood supply is about 3% of the population. And there's an adequate blood supply for any situation, 3%. And that is what I lived through in England, seeing that availability and witnessing the, uh, and keeping at the back of my mind, the disparity that occurred at home. And seeing the differences between uh, the English citizens and the immigrant populations, where there were always poor donation habits. So when, upon our return, I got the impression that people in England generally thought that uh, non-English people did not donate blood willingly. So we saw, to, from what I recalled, um, it seemed that people were willing at home. So we did a survey and he came back and found that they were right. People did not have a positive attitude to blood donation in Trinidad and Tobago. As a matter of fact, blood donation was low in all socio-demographic groups, age, gender, race, religion, everything, education, all very low blood donation rates. And as it turned out, it was all to do with never having been told about it and never having had the opportunity. So this was published in 2007. As a direct result, we could see the amount of blood collected in the country is about 20,000 units. And it has been at that level since uh, 2006. It remains the same now. This is the uh, amount of blood that is recommended for a country that engages in the complexity of medical procedures that we do here, thanks to the excellent training we receive at the University of the West Indies. So we saw that blood donation was low in all groups, and people in the age group 16 to 25 comprise only 7% of donors, a fistful. Later on, this is when I was director of the Blood Transfusion Service, we looked at blood donor deferrals at the, the NBTS in Port of Spain, and it was about over 40%. It means that 40% of your people who came in to give blood were deferred. And they found that the reason was a combination of things. One of them, it was very much coercion. So many unsuitable people found themselves the donation queue, irrespective of their state of health. The second thing was that people were not aware of the eligibility criteria. So people came in without or with, uh, with contraindications to donate. And the third thing was because there was this suspicion of blood being sold. Uh, the nurses were especially uh, rigid in their screening of blood donors. So it all 
eventually eventuated in, in there being a high deferral rates. So these were the two patterns of blood donation in Trinidad and Tobago upon my return. Uh, people donated blood in medium of a patient on the ward. And they got this, which is called a chit in return. Bone, they could not use it for anybody else. They had to get another one. This is called the chit. And in parallel, there was what was called a credit system where there was a mobile unit that would go to certain places, schools and business places and so on. And banks and insurance places and allow people to donate. And then, For each donation, this credit could be used to claim a unit of the company that's like any more credit. So they have that 50 years of the On the day, there was a So it's like an account. It's like it was at one time we got interest. If you had five credits, and these systems were ongoing since the 1970s. Yes, I'm here and here. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, from here. Okay, you hearing me well now? Okay. Okay, so the chat was that if there was a patient in hospital, the relative was asked either by a doctor or a nurse to donate the blood for, for the patient, it was called. If it was uh, determined or decided that the patient needed three units of blood, the patient had to find three blood donors. And each blood donor would go to the hospital blood collection center and uh, donate a unit and be given what is called a chit. They still exist in the patient's name, ward, signature, date. And this chit was valid for only six months. So if the patient were, was having a donation for an operation or so, and it was for beyond six months, it meant um, they had to go find new chips. Did you hear all that? Yeah. It, Anne Marie, yeah. did you hear that? And then there was the credit system, which operated largely uh, via the a mobile unit. And the mobile unit would visit uh, banks, business places, some schools and anybody who donated a unit of blood there got a credit for each donation. And that credit had no lifespan. You could keep it forever. And whenever one was inclined, one could use the credit to claim a unit of blood from the blood transfusion service. Did you hear all of it this time? Okay, that's fine. So it is an, an unequal system, both undesirable, but there was inequality even in the undesirability. It was six months versus permanent. Then it was a named recipient, well, at once, it could not be transferred, but here it was a named recipient at any time. So you can decide at any time that my unit goes to so-and-so at any time. This was done largely in the hospital donation centers on a first come first serve basis. 
And this was done in a more convenient setting of a mobile unit. And there's an appointment system. So one could make an appointment. This happened largely at the hospital donation centers. And this happened at select places. So there are two types of blood donation. Not surprisingly, problems arose with this. On the one hand, it caused shortages because people donated blood only when uh, there was a family member in need rather than on a regular basis. They could not do it on a regular basis because what if you were donating regularly and then you called upon to donate for your, your mother who's had a, who needs surgery? So it prevented people from donating regularly and voluntarily. As you imagine, it is very stressful for families and relatives. It could cause a sense of indebtedness out in the community if somebody uh, gives blood to save your life. I think you owe them quite a lot. It endangered public safety because people who are unfit to donate, for example, with risky habits, sometimes forced to donate because their relative is in need. Like we said, it prevented voluntary blood donation. It caused a lot of wastage because there's no coordination of a donation to, to meet supply. And it's just boom and bust. So you collect 15 units. Well, it not seldom happens. But let's say, like here, there's a, a mad rush for somebody who are, is having a well, that poor fellow had lost an arm in a boating accident. And his family flocked to the donation center. Very uh, popular young man. So I think about 40 or 50 people. But then it, but that might happen at the time when the, the need is not very much. Or the blood group donated is not in, 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 you know, required. So they it cause a lot of wastage. It causes unnecessary transfusions as well, because people feel that having found their blood donors, the entire transfusion, so they demand it. It creates artificial shortages because there could be blood there, but it belongs to somebody else, so it can't be used. It is unequal because not everybody could find blood donors. Not everybody works in the banks or insurance companies that visited. It could cause profiteering because people sell chits and credits. It creates unwillingness to share among the donation centers and the hospital. That is wastage, blood collected that is not used, that is stress. A pregnant woman told you have to get blood donors to have your baby. And this is wastage, this is blood stored in the fridge in a hospital ward just to make sure it is available because there's a general shortage and the supply is unpredictable. But these were the merchants of blood exposed in a daily paper because there's quite an industry out there. There are many resolutions advocating against replacement blood donation and for voluntary non remunerated blood donation. And these are some of them, there are many, many. And it's all to do with safety, equality, and adequacy. And these are World Health Organization recommendations. In 2010, when an attempt was made to discontinue chits and credits, blood donations at all the centers and only mobile unit fell quite dramatically. The system was reintroduced, but the systems were reintroduced. For all the time when they, uh, that dramatic fall occurred, we were trying to understand what happened and realize that this is uh, probably uh, an information and, uh, and, and, and probably the role of a, a university to get involved in, in the education or information sharing with the public. And what better place than the medical school to start to share information with the public and with our, 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 our future doctors and future leaders and so on. So we formed the University of Yesterday's Blood Donor Foundation in 2011 and did this official launch in 2013. That is a 
Professor Sir George Allen, who was the Chancellor of the University at the time, He's the previous city director of PAHO for 10 years. This is uh, Professor Samuel Ramsuak, who was the Dean of the University at the time. So this is how the world distribution of, of uh, blood donation look. As you can see, most of the blood is collected in uh, developed countries who practice voluntary, non remunerated blood donation. North America, Europe, Sorry, um, this, uh, where, where is this? Australia, New Zealand. And Argentina has recently uh, joined the crew. So you can see it's mostly the uh, wealthy European countries and what we call the uh, settler colonies, the places where the, the offshoots of the metropolitan society took root and formed the majority of the population, they set up blood transfusion services that mimicked that, that occurred in, in the United Kingdom and so on. But in none of the previous colonies, India, Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, did voluntary non remunerated blood donation take root. And therefore, least blood is collected in those countries where paradoxically 50 percent of the world's population 80 percent sorry the pop world's population lives in these uh what are called poor countries 80 percent and they collect about 20 percent of the world's blood but the reverse like 20 percent of the world's population lives in these countries and they collect most of the world's blood. So therefore, most of the blood is available in, in the places where it's uh, less required. And we sort of explain this, this um, dichotomy because it, it troubled me, it still does. Why did this happen? And we did a lot of research that I'll tell you about. This is a poster presented at the, the Society for Hematology Conference in 2014, and it described the sequence of events. In effect, blood donation started in Europe, started as a animal, animal transfusions and animal, human transfusions, then human, human. Then it was advanced further in America and Canada, which was settler colonies of England. And then during World War I, American and Canadian surgeons transferred new techniques back to the British. It taught them new strokes. And then between World War I and World War II, these communities uh, learned the practice from the soldiers who were present in World War I. So voluntary blood donor panels were formed in between the wars. In 1936, there was a Spanish civil war, and it was during that war that the Spaniards, uh, predominantly this uh, hematologist called Horda, and his, his colleague called Hume from Canada, they established community blood donation programs to provide blood for the army, and they use uh, anticoagulant and refrigeration to collect blood in the community and take it to the front line. And it was so successful that the British, they are doing it as well, as the Americans and Canadians, so that in time for World War II, a lot of blood was collected this way from the communities in, in anticipation of German air raids. So the communities were mobilized into voluntary blood donation. It was a community effort so that by the end of the World War II, it became a community norm in these countries. However, this kind of behavior, the reasons that we're examining now, and I will uh, share with you in the not too distant future, 
what well, this kind of activity is not undertaken in, in the colonies like uh, India, Africa, the West Indies, and so on. And, and we have some uh, theories and explanations for that. But the end result was that at the end of that war, there was no community blood donation in those countries. Instead of developing community uh, blood donation programs in those countries, the British and the Americans flew blood in for the soldiers. So this pre uh, preempted the need for the communities to donate blood. We collaborated with several agencies to look into the history of blood donation in Trinidad and Tobago and see what happened in the world wars, why it did not happen. Nobody knew anything of any blood donation happening down here during the world war. After the world war, the Red Cross started mobile collections, but then we quickly moved to collecting blood from people's relatives on the wards. We did some outreach to encourage the children into the, con the, the concept of uh, blood donation because it's generally not known about. We went to the Coast Guard, to several high schools, and many of these are now medical students. Huh? And part of the uh, of our association, I'm going to tell you, we did surveys in the community and confirmed blood donation habits, fear of donating, an awareness of sickle cell disease and thalassemia, poor knowledge of the eligibility criteria, fear that they could contract HIV or have B from donating blood. So a lot of misinformation. People have no idea how the blood donation systems worked outside of Trinidad and Tobago, or even in Trinidad and Tobago. Many thought that blood was collected and was used to treat mostly criminals. But interestingly, quite a high number were willing to convert to voluntary non remunerated blood donation. Repeated the survey of uh, attitudes to blood donation after the return of the CHIT system and found that uh, the knowledge on attitudes had not changed. In effect, any measures implemented to in preparation for discontinuation of the CHITs and credits had no impact on knowledge, attitudes, and practices. It needed redoing. In addition, the donors remained willing to convert. So these were the main research findings over of, of a five-year period. We thought we'd address them in our Blood Donor Foundation, and we did so by targeting the youth, the young people. And predominantly, the voluntary and religious medical student organizations is the Medical Students Association, Movement for Empowerment of Dharmic Studies, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, Mount Hope Islamic Society, Leadership Council, Share Goodness. So it's good because these people already have a history of volunteerism. And so they have the right ilk. And we thought because this concept of giving and blood is common to all religions, giving, charity, we targeted religious groups, it could have some impact. And it did. And we targeted the medical students because they were the future consultants, administrators, and politicians. And we suspected they could influence their parents and their communities. And boy, were we correct. So we started the Blood Donor Foundation. And in 2015, we formed a collaboration with the North Central Regional Health Authority to have blood drives every three months. Appointment system, most of the communication is by social media. We train the nurses, inform people of the eligibility criteria. We had a hematology doctor on site to screen the pearls so they're not excessive and unnecessary. And CRHA helped us with venue, 
lab facilities, blood donor foundation for rising donors, some nursing t-shirts, all blood donated, no strings attached, no checks, no accounts, no credits. In some surmise, it would last. The dead and it grew from strength to strength over a five-year period. We started off with 13 units being collected on the first event, which was March 15, 2015. And by 2018, we were routinely collecting over 100 units in the eight hour period, which is quite a lot of blood. Most of our donors are the 18 to 25 age group. Most of our donors are female, which remember I told you about the uh, imbalance in the replacement group. Most donors are males, but most of our donors are females here. And they keep coming back. Most of our donors are repeat donors. They've been with it before. So that adds to safety. And generally, when you compared this donation group with the other group, we found that the deferrals were a lot lower. And the rates of initial reactive tests is a lot lower as well. So it has a lot safer, efficient, a lot more. But these are some of our, our blood donors. And we have so many hundreds now and their families, and it's really a joy to be home. Some of you will have witnessed the phenomenon. So we started off in effect with 0% voluntary non remunerated blood donors in 2014, and by 2018, it was 1.4%. It's a good start, it's something on which to expand. This led to a review of national policy because uh, Whereas it was thought before, you can't get people to do that. It was proof that it could be done. So really, there was no excuse for carrying on with uh, the previous ways of doing things. So in October 2018, the Minister of Health announced that he was going to abolish the Chitan credit system and move towards 100% voluntary, non related blood donation. Subsequently, the Ministry of Health and UWI supported the establishment of the DM in heme and blood transfusion to support this initiative in the long term. And this is what the DM in heme and blood banking uh, entails. It is based on the curriculum of the FRC path exam, and this we did with permission from the UK Specialist Training Authority. It's a four year program. There's a UK elective component. There are UK examiners involved. People will do the exams concurrently, both, because we intend eventually to show that the candidates are well prepared for the FRC path and to achieve equivalence, or recognition of equivalence. The entry requirements will be the MRCP or the DM part one. And enrollment is to start in September 2021. It was supposed to start in March of this year, but with COVID, several of the applicants were unable to travel to the UK to complete the MRCP exam. So we'll start in September 2021. During COVID, we found that medical students uh, initially expressed a fear of contracting COVID and our donations, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, our donations fell. However, the female donations went up and the repeat donations went up in proportion. And when we introduced some COVID information, <laughs> the donations went back up to baseline. For findings, the NRD is possible, it is responsive to COVID, it is durable, it can be done, and uh, we're aiming towards 100% expansion. I'll share some of my slides with you. This is a bone marrow trephine from a patient with myelofibrosis. You can see the big, wide osteoid seam with some reticulant fibrosis flowing through there. It would show a best reticulin staining, which, which, which is not done here. 
for this man had massive spedomegaly, anemia, and a leukerous phoblastic blood film. This young lady had a neutrophil, uh, eosinophil count of over 20, normal being less than between, I think it's less than 0.5. He had repeated attacks of angio edema and rashes and wheezing and so on. And uh, this was a bone marrow aspirate and trephine, and it shows an abundance of eosinophils. So she met the morphological criteria for the idiopathic hyperesinophilic syndrome. We place on first line therapy with steroids, all the symptoms resolved and a white cell count normalized. So she's now on tapering doses of steroids. This patient with HIV was pancytopenic, and this was his bone marrow aspirate, which showed a surfeit of macrophages. And you can see the macrophages imbibing the red cells, the nucleated red cells, the lymphocytes, the monocytes even. So this caused pancytopenia. So he came up with a syndrome, which is a very poor prognostic development in HIV. And uh, the young man died uh, shortly after. This is another view of his bone marrow showing a uh, Involvement of a neutrophil here and a red cell. The red cell, some platelets in there. Neutrophil platelets being engulfed by the macrophage. This young lady is a, a double vendor from Debe. We were presented with a pain in the left upper quadrant. He had massive spinomegaly, and this is a blood film showing eastern fills. Many uh, that's uh, that's a, a, a band cell there, and uh, myelocytes. And this is probably a pro myelocyte. So, all the uh, cells in the uh, neutrophil maturation sequence. So, this morphologically fits the diagnostic criteria for chronic myeloid leukemia. She did not. Uh, of the Philadelphia chromosome with the BCRA fusion gene and responded very well to hydroxyurea, then tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. This person had a mean cell volume of 127, and we questioned whether it was a B12 or folate deficiency, but it turned out to be a red cell agglutination causing the red cells to agglutinate and be counted as, as one big mass when the mean cell volume is being measured. This man had myeloma and a plasma cytoma, meaning a collection of plasma cells. Bone marrow is packed with plasma cells. And he has a trephine biopsy specimen. This is somebody else who presented with myeloma, and you can see he has plasma cells are increasing this bone marrow, eccentric nucleus, blue cytoplasm, perinuclear, peri pale zone where the immunoglobulin molecules are made, very uh, abnormal plasma cells. He went back to, he's an Indian diplomat, he went back home and had an autologous stem cell transplant. So we've discussed hematology and blood transfusions in career. The, my experiences on returning home, how we researched the reality, how we built a solution, and I shared a few of my slides with you. I thank you for your attention and will uh, feel any questions. I hope I didn't go too, too far over my time over my time at all. Thank you very much. So at this point, we will now take any questions directed to Dr. Carl. Feel free to put on your mic and ask your question or place them in the chat and we'll read them. Yeah, so two questions that were submitted before the, before the session began. The first is, can you tell us why you specifically chose hematology and what or who inspired you to do so? Oh, why I chose... Uh... Hematology. Yes. 
Okay, I chose hematology because when I, it was, I think it was in physiology class in year one in uh, Jamaica, you know, there was this red or purple text on hematology that just appealed to me. I just liked it. And then I moved on and I say, I just like the, the whole concept of it, the, the flowing of blood, and I just loved it. I, I'm grateful for that, that. It just happened. And then, very much like many of you, when I did pathology, that became my first love, or so I thought. But then, when I did medicine, I realized I'd love to do a combination of medicine and, hemato and, and, and pathology and hematology offered that. So I went back to that and then I, after I, uh, when I came back here, I worked with Dr. Waverly Charles for a while. She was a big encouragement as well. And a great source of advice and direction. And, uh, oh, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. At, at one time, I was uh, became uh, ambivalent, and then I had a, a, a major, major life event in that I, I was involved in a very serious road traffic accident. And uh, at that time, I changed my mind. I was going to do obstetrics and gynecology, and, and then my mind was uh, put back straight for me. Because when, when I, um, I was, uh, I, I don't want to use the word disabled, but uh, I had to be on crutches on that for two years. And uh, so it was more, I suppose, more convenient to be doing hematology at that time. So I spent quite a lot of time doing hematology in, in that our recovery, recovery period. And uh, then I, I went, so I did part one of the MRCP down here. So when I went to England, I already knew what I was going to do. And because of uh, my hematology experience from here, I think I'd worked in 18 months in hematology before I went up there. So it was uh, fairly easy to get jobs in hematology. And uh, yeah, we took so from us blessed to end up in a, I've met some lovely people all of my life. And I trained initially in the south of England. And uh, after 1995, I went to Sheffield, where I spent about six years. Yeah, and they really are. Yeah, it's quite a joy. I've, I've enjoyed it. I really enjoy what I do. And I won't um, change it for anything. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, was I rambling? No, no, it was a very nice story and very inspirational. Um, okay. We also have a second question. So it's actually a two-part two question. The question is, what is a common misconception associated with hematopathology? pathology? Um, so the second question is, what is a misconception associated with hematopathology pathology and hematopathologists? that you think should be addressed? And the second part is what advice do you have to students interested in hematopathology and transfusion medicine? Yes. Oh, yeah, how do I do that? Yes. You see me now? Okay. Yes, Amanda, I wasn't understanding the question. Okay, so the first part was, what is a common misconception associated with hematopathology and hematopathologists that you think should be addressed? A misconception. Uh, I, you see, I don't know if, uh, first thing, I, I it's, uh, well, I know some, some of the, 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 the 
initial misconceptions. I, I, I could tell you, like uh, the days before, uh, people did medicine before hematology and so on. Hematologists were seen as lab people without, without uh, clinical or uh, nothing clinical to offer. And then that changed. And I think one of the common misconceptions now is that hematologists are there to find blood for you. Yes? And uh, another of the misconceptions is that, um, yeah, I don't want to be apolitical, but um, there are specific things that are the domain of the hematologists, but is not yet recognized. So, and that, I think that arose because there was this shortage of hematologists. So a lot of people who were not uh, initially intended to be doing things ended up taking on hematological responsibilities. Which, and that is a problem. I hope it is solved as uh, you all uh, populate the profession with many hematologists. So you could take over, for example, all the anticoagulation, yes, all the difficult anticoagulation. So all the hemophiliacs who come into hospital immediately come under the care of a hematologist. All the sickle cell disease patients, likewise, yes, and all blood for transfusion must be screened by the hematology unit before administration. Yes, it's quite a, uh, uh, it's like a quite a, a, a uh, a protection scheme, huh? but if there aren't enough numbers, it is not seen. Like when I was in training, for example, I mean, we were all big, hard back men and, and, and women, or whatever the equivalent is for a woman. And as senior as we were, if there was a patient coming in, yes. A uh, hemophiliac patient, and you see the patient, you had to phone the professor to discuss the patient. Yes? So there's no question of somebody coming in and having 10,000 units of this, and, and, and nobody knows. It, is, it just did not happen. Is that Ian David, my friend from presentation color? Ian, is that you? Is he, he disappeared? Accidentally, or are you trying to avoid me? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll clear that up afterwards. It's good to see him. We go back quite a long way, you know. Quite a long way. Some very faithful friends from Presentation College. Yes, Amanda, so that's the main misconception that, uh, that I find. And it, it's, uh, I think it's a miscalculation of the role of the hematologist. And that has arisen because there aren't enough in numbers. So that in, in many respects, we had to um, up, uh, offload some responsibilities to other disciplines. And it becomes very difficult to, to reclaim them. Yes, SK, it's me. And nice yeah, good, to see you. You. good to see you. How are you? Excellent, thank you. Right. What brings right. you to these parts? Not that I'm complaining, you know. <laughs> well, this was passed around by the past students and um, Fredo and Canada says to, to, to log in and, and to support you and to, you know. Oh, I mean, to support me, it's a protector from Amanda, was it? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> good to see but you, Carl. Good, good, good. Nice to see you. So the second part of this question was, what advice do you have for students interested in hematopathology and transfusion medicine? OK. Um, if you, well, I am now, um, well, as you can tell, I am biased. I, I, um, I do like to, to, to hear 
hematology being broken up into hematopathology and so on. I like it to be seen as one discipline that encompasses all of those. And hematopathology is just one part of it, huh? as is transfusion medicine. And the place that allows this breadth of training without separation is the United Kingdom. And I am biased towards that. And so I am declaring that. And it is on that basis that we developed the program here that is a, a, a replica of the United Kingdom program. But it does is not intended to preclude people going abroad and getting experience. There's nothing like exposure to other places. See how different people think and how they operate. Yes, it is quite disadvantageous to remain in one place for too long. So I would suggest um, broad exposure, read widely, become socially aware. History, everything related, because it all comes back to that. Everything comes back to that. And when you understand those things, you understand your role in society, your responsibilities to other people, you develop compassion, you take your job seriously, and the materially specifics become uh, like a secondary. And you enjoy what you're doing, because you develop compassion within it and around it. So make sure you love it. And um, if you want to make a lot of money, you can. Yes? But you might find that that doesn't um, thrill you when you discover the thrills of the academia and the writing and, the, and the, the, the discovery and the transformation of people's lives. So it's quite fulfilling. You can, be, you can make what you want of it. And it's totally up to you. It's a lovely specialty, and I would advise anybody to go into it because, like I said, right here, we need about 20 hematologists. Yes, we've always needed that, and we'll get and the hematologists, and we'll get more as the, the recognition of the specialty increases. 50% uh, of the UK is. 30% of the UK's population is expected to be a black and ethnic minority by the year 2050. That equates to management of uh, diseases that are unique or, or better or more managed in, in uh, the countries of origin. There's a tremendous problem in getting ethnic minority people to donate blood. It's a global problem. And they appear to have difficulty finding a recipe for doing it. And we intend to patent the UE Blood Donor Foundation's model as a mechanism of doing it. And it's based purely on information and empowerment. So there's a wide scope and there's, there's, a, there's a, an avenue for impacting our featured speaker Dr. Charles is having some connectivity issues so we are just going to end off the event so I hope everyone had a wonderful and learning experience. At this time, a feedback form link has been sent and we would like you to take a minute and fill it out. It will be a great tip appreciated for documentation and perhaps for improvements of future events. And since Dr. Charles uh, is not here with us right now, the feedback will be relayed to him. Alfredo Pinto once said, saying thank you is more than good manners, it is good spirituality. Firstly, I'd like to thank our featured speaker, Dr. Kenneth Charles, who despite his busy schedule, graced us this evening with an amazing and enlightening presentation where we were all extremely grateful to learn about hematology and transfusion medicine. Whilst we are most happy that you were able to give us an insight to the behind the scenes of blood pathologies for patients, here in the Caribbean, we are hopeful that your audience was able to take the pertinent notes and was reminded, if not educated, on the importance of hematologists. 
I would also like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Alfredo Walker and Dr. Catherine Morris, our two advisory board members for joining us this evening. And we want you to know that we appreciate your endless support and we want to thank you for playing a key role in supporting us throughout this journey. Uh, we also want to thank you all for taking your valuable time, effort and consideration in the investment uh, to nurture and properly establish the future of pathology. Uh, it is not an act of success, but one of greatness, showing us the paths that you have all walked. I'd also like to recognize Justice the Honorable Cathy Ann Lachu of the High Court of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Gary Collins, the Chief Medical Officer of Delaware, and Dr. Roque Blanco, the Medical Examiner of Belize National Forensic Services. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for accompanying us tonight and making this event a success, and we look forward to your continued support. To all of our UE students and staff across the three campuses at the University of the Ottawa and Eastern Ontario Laboratory Regional Association, and especially to our specially invited guests, thank you, thank you, thank you. Our next epantry session will feature Dr. Wesley Greaves of Next Gen Pathologies, and he will deliver a 45 minute talk on molecular pathology and its application to treatment and malignancies. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of this evening's session. Good evening.